Okay, so Margaret Murphy is going to speak to us about what midwives need to know when caring for couples who are pregnant after stillbirth. And Margaret is, lives in Cork in Ireland. She's been a midwifery lecturer for over 13 years and she teaches at all levels. She's got a special interest in pregnancy loss and pregnancy after loss. And this presentation is based on her doctoral studies. So I'm going to hand the mic and the presenters uh, make you a presenter as well, Margaret. And thank you very much. We're really looking forward to hearing your presentation. And you unmute yourself first. Thank you, Linda. <clears throat> and uh, just to wish everybody a very um, happy International Midwives Day and greetings from a very um, unseasonally sunny Cork. So as Linda said, I am a, a lecturer in midwifery and I have been a midwife um, for um, over 20 years now and have been in education for the last 13. So like all good research questions, um, I think clinical practice informs um, a, a lot of these issues. And, and before I finished in clinical practice, I was working as a as a manager in a neonatal unit. And I was wondering what um, couples' experiences of loss was, was like and what that would be like for them when they became pregnant again. So in terms of today's presentation, um, what I would like to do is, is begin by outlining the, the, the relevance and context of perinatal loss and look at the impact and significance of pregnancy loss on couples because I was very interested in the, the um, couple dynamic. Just talk a little bit about the experience of grief and attachment and transition and expected anxiety in pregnancy after loss because much has been written in the literature um, about this. And then finally, just to look at the challenges of pregnancy after loss for couples, including what I found were gender specific um, issues for um, couples. So we know that perinatal loss is the most common complication of pregnancy. Um, it's confirmed that one in four confirmed pregnancies will end in a miscarriage. But exact figures are, are often difficult to ascertain because many women uh, never present to healthcare services. They may um, experience pregnancy loss at home or they may experience it in the community and may never um, engage fully with healthcare services and for the for the purposes of today's presentation when I talk about perinatal loss I'm in talking about miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy or pregnancy of unknown location, uh, stillbirth, termination of pregnancy for fetal anomalies and also neonatal death. Um, globally stillbirth remains um, a very um, important public health issue um, the Lancet Stillbirth series published a second series in 2016 on ending preventable stillbirths. And we know that there are approximately 2.6 million babies that are stillborn each year. And um, predominantly, 98% of these pregnancy losses are occurring in uh, low and middle income countries. But pregnancy uh, loss remains an issue for high income countries too. And there are challenges that we will we will talk about in terms of um, to collecting data, looking at taboo and stigma, and actually looking for um, policymakers to in act and invest in the issue. So the majority of deaths, while they occur in low and middle income countries, also affect women in high income countries. And studies have told us that, that there are profound physical, psychological, social and economic effects of stillbirth that are often um, unrecognised in terms of um, both health healthcare professionals, but also in wider society. And factors such as poverty, healthcare inequality and lack of trained birth attendants all contribute to these figures because many babies, particularly in low income countries, are, are actually entering um, labour alive, but um, may, may die in labour or are close to birth. And in terms of the global sustainable development goals, 
compared to the neonatal statistics, stillbirth has remained largely invisible on the global health agenda. Now, there have been some changes and there are welcome moves towards um, looking at stillbirth in, in, within the global context, but a, lo a lot more needs to be done in terms of explicitly naming it as a public health concern. So there, as I mentioned, there are, there are many challenges globally because even discovering the incidence of stillbirth and uh, classifying its cause in, in low resource settings can be very challenging. Uh, late registration of pregnancy, insufficient prenatal ca um, care, a lack of low cost technologies to evaluate um, placentas or to conduct autopsies or even to identify a harmful organisms that may contribute to stillbirth all uh, contribute to the challenges that we are facing globally. So therefore, um, causes of stillbirth in low and middle income countries has mostly been derived from either verbal autopsy reports or clinical symptoms reported uh, by the mother or caregiver. And across the globe, we have no universally agreed uniform system to classify the causes of stillbirth. Professor Vicky Flanadi in Australia has been looking at this issue and she has um, uncovered more than 33 um, different classification systems. And likewise, we have no universally agreed definition when it comes to terms. So, for instance, um, in some jurisdictions, stillbirth is classified as a pregnancy greater than 20 weeks. Um, here in Ireland, uh, it's greater than 24 completed weeks. And the World Health Organization has a 28 week um, classification. And all of these are challenging in terms of um, reporting global um, instances and comparisons across healthcare services. Um, it's only really in the last um, maybe five years that we have looked at, research has looked at the, the, the impact of stillbirth. Um, previously, uh, in terms of maybe the social and the financial cost. Previously, um, research studies have looked at, at the impact maybe on individual individual women or groups of women or their, um, their partners. But um, at a societal level, it's really only in the last um, five years that researchers have begun to look globally at the issue. And um, they have been found that there, is, there are major um, social and financial impacts in terms of stillbirth. And in many cultures, stillbirth carries major social taboos. Um, and therefore women and, their, and by association, their families are often marginalized and stigmatized. And in some cultures, um, it is, um, women are actually penalized for their, their experiences of pregnancy loss um, in terms of both um, societal um, exclusion, but also in um, particularly in, in certain countries in South America, they may even face, um, they may even face criminal um, prosecution. And we know from the from this, the psychological research that has been done that when, when the grief of, of loss is unacknowledged, particularly perinatal loss, it can lead to a concept known as disenfranchised grief. And disenfranchised grief is where the, the grieving individual isn't, isn't um, their grief isn't um, appreciated or their, um, their grief isn't acknowledged. And disenfranchised grief is associated with major health outcomes, including depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety and, and challenges in bonding or attaching to, to children born um, subsequent to, um, to loss. So it's a very important issue to cons consider. Within the maternity um, arena, we have, I'm sure we're all very well aware um, of the, um, the movement, particularly by ICM, the World Health Organization, and the White Ribbon Alliance towards the development of respectful um, maternity care. And um, the, the principles that respectful maternity care um, espouse are very similar to the um, to the issues that we need to consider when we when it comes to talking about respectful um, bereavement care. And here in Ireland, um, 
we've been very fortunate in 2016. Um, we, we published national standards for bereavement care uh, following pregnancy loss and perinatal death. And that was a, these were multidisciplinary standards um, developed by um, obstetricians, midwives, um, healthcare chaplains, bereaved parents, social workers, um, a, a, a wide range of, of, of disciplines um, represented. And uh, we've just um, finished a two year rollout program of these national standards. And the standards really had four pillars looking at um, bereavement care in terms of its ethos. And you can see there that the standard is that it's central to the mission of the hospital or maternity service as, and it is offered in accordance with the religious, secular, ethnic, social and cultural values of the parents who've experienced a pregnancy loss or perinatal death. The second, the second pillar is, is around the hospital or healthcare service that it has systems in place to ensure that bereavement care and end of life care for babies is central to the mission of the organisation and that care is organised around particular individual babies and their families. Um, the third pillar is around the, the baby and the parents themselves, that each family and baby receives high quality palliative and end of life care that's appropriate to their wishes and needs of their, of their parents. And then very importantly, the fourth pillar is concerning healthcare staff, because um, we know that caring is um, emotionally uh, challenging work and uh, there is an emotional labour attached to caring and caring in the face of, of um, pregnancy loss and bereavement care is, is hugely important because um, if staff um, are not supported and cared for, then how can they be expected to provide compassionate bereavement care to, um, to uh, women and their families? And so the issue of, of uh, second victims in terms of experiencing uh, traumatic um, maternity encounters and support for staff is, is a huge um, component of these bereavement standards. And um, as a result of the implementation of the standards, we recently, um, just last month, launched a new website in Ireland. You can see it there, pregnancyandinfantloss.ie. It's a one-stop shop um, for parents, for healthcare workers, for the members, members of the public um, to look at all, um, to look at all um, areas of um, supporting um, bereaved families. So I'd encourage you all to, to check that out. So um, Fran Boyle and her team in Australia as well have looked at developing clinical practice guidelines. And these are just recently published only in the last month or so um, for bereavement care. And you can see that there's a lovely um, infographic looking at, again, the idea of respectful and supportive care um, for families and uh, some some fine pillars there good communication recognition of parenthood effective support and shared decision making all in the um all under the umbrella of the organization response so we know from research that care at the time of loss is hugely important to how um women are able to um cope with and um um how their families are able to cope with their experiences of bereavement So care at the time of loss involves um, breaking bad news and good communication is the key here to, to um, breaking bad news because unfortunately, um, we don't talk to women about the likelihood that their pregnancy may end in a, in a loss. Um, I've thought about this for a long time and maybe it comes from um, a paternalistic attitude of healthcare providers that they don't want to worry women maybe that, that um, by talking about the fact that not, not every pregnancy will end in a loss. Um, unfortunately, we're doing a disservice, I feel, to women because um, even in my own study, um, the women said, you know, um, every single couple said, we just didn't know this could happen to us. How is this still a thing, you know? People are aware of miscarriage, they're aware that, um, of early losses, but actually the fact that a, ch a child or a baby might die 
closer to birth is is often um, unless they know somebody personally is often not seen as a possibility on today's international day of the midwife continuity of carer is hugely important to women um, both at the time of loss and how they are cared for at the time of loss but also into their into their postnatal care and even into their planning of their subsequent pregnancies um, the women in my study said that they um, it was because of the care they received by the midwives within the healthcare services and, and also by the obstetricians that look after them that actually helped them to uh, make decisions around planning future pregnancies. Shared decision making is hugely important, um, it, particularly in an environment where um, women and their partners will feel completely out of control. So um, they need um, to be involved in shared decision making about labour and birth, but also about, about meeting their baby. And again, this is a topic that has been um, contentious in, in, in previous years uh, or in the last few years because um, we went from a situation in the, in the up to the um, early um, 1980s and into the 1990s in some countries where women were actively discouraged from uh, meeting their babies and indeed there are there are many countries and cultures ac across the globe today that still believe that it is harmful for women um, either um, emotionally or culturally to meet their babies and and yet we have some very um, robust empirical evidence that would say that it is helpful for parents to meet um, to meet their baby at the time of loss however as midwives, we cannot underestimate actually how challenging this can be. And it's something that needs consideration. Um, in my study in particular, the, 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 the partners, the fathers found it very challenging um, to actually meet their babies. And it often created disharmony between the couple because the women were very anxious to meet the baby at the time of their baby's birth, whereas the men struggled um, to meet their babies. Parental recognition is hugely important because this is these parents' one opportunity to parent that baby. And it's about facilitating memory making for us as midwives to be able to um, suggest um, memory making um, practices or to um, encourage and role model good behaviour. Uh, one of the uh, one of the women in my study said talked specifically about the time of her her baby's birth and the care that the midwife um, provided in terms of uh, greeting her baby when she was born speaking to her baby as if she were a live baby and also about um, you know um, when she was helping the parents to ba to bathe the baby that um, she tested the water with her elbow as as we would be as we would have been taught to do as midwives and the mother was the mother acknowledged that well look the baby couldn't feel the temperature of the water but the fact that the midwife cared for her baby in such a compassionate way meant a lot to that to that particular woman so um professor sue down and her colleagues in in the uk did a did a very good a qualitative study looking at um parents experiences and what they found is that we have one opportunity to get it right. We cannot uh, make um, the baby um, not, not be dead, but we can certainly um, prevent further harm by compassionate bereavement care at the time of loss. And also supportive care is important for women, for their partners, for their families, and as I mentioned, um, for um, healthcare staff themselves. There are many there are many myths about grief that 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 that, that, um, that are that are at large I suppose across the globe. The idea that grief is something that you get through, that you get over, and this comes I suppose from old theories of grief, where we would look at stages of grief and the idea of resolution from grief that you would move on from it. But actually, newer um, theories would say that actually grief is never fully completed because we have great love 
and great attachment, there will be always a great sense of loss and grief. So therefore, one never really gets over a loss. It's rather about moving forward and finding meaning in life um, with the loss of that of that individual. And the same is true for bereaved parents. They love their babies dearly and um, their babies will always be a part of their lives. So therefore, they will continuously grieve uh, their baby's loss. Uh, there won't ever be a time when they won't think of their bereaved ch child or children. And there will never be a stage where they get over the, the death of their baby. Um, so perinatal loss is often seen as a, as a unique type of, of loss because it's largely invisible. It doesn't occur within the social spectrum of, of, of loss that we see with maybe um, older children or with adults. And uh, there is often a combination of grief and trauma, as I said previously, because in many cases, there is an, 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 um, there, this loss isn't expected. And again, with pregnancy after loss, which I will, which I'll move on to talking about, um, the um, there are new layers of grief emerging. Uh, Joanne Cacciatore in America talks about this concept of remourning. Uh, so therefore, a pregnancy after loss is not a, a cure all or a panacea for all ills. Actually, pregnancy after loss has been shown to. Um, involve increased symptoms of anxiety, and that's very commonplace. So the majority of couples who experience a stillbirth progress to a subsequent pregnancy, often within a very short time frame of their loss. Um, and in 2018, we published a study looking at um, a global survey of almost 3,000 parents and looked at their experiences. And we found that 66% um, of couples were pregnant again within 12 months of their index loss. Um, so the fact that couples are pregnant again within a short time frame can have implications in the subsequent pregnancy. Um, because they are pregnant again while they are still actively grieving the loss of the baby who died. Um, so perinatal death, the grief of loss and the experiences of subsequent pregnancies all affect the couple dynamic with gender differences that um, often apparent. And again, these gender differences um, can be explained in somewhat by the concept of attachment and transition and how that varies between women and, and men. And um, for women, theorists tell us that attachment and transition to motherhood begins once the diagnosis of pregnancy is confirmed. And um, obviously there is a physical connection between the mother and her baby. And there are often physical symptoms. So therefore, um, even while externally the, the, the woman may not appear pregnant, internally she may have experiences such as uh, morning sickness, breast um, changes, um, changes in sense of smell, taste, um, things like that. And so for women, the baby becomes real over time. They are um, attaching and transitioning in a, in a continuum. And um, initially in, in, in first trimester, um, it's about themselves and their physical symptoms. In second trimester, it becomes more about the being aware of the fe fetal movements and the fetus um, as an individual and finally in the third trimester as birth is imminent women women look towards labor and birth and they look towards the anticipation of meeting this new this new person so there is a physical and emotional attachment to the baby and Joanne O'Leary um, a colleague of mine in the US has published some amazing work on attachment and transition to to um to to babies in utero for men, attachment and trans transition is slightly different. Um, there may be a cognitive relationship to the baby. So men, men are aware that women are pregnant, but um, they, because they don't have that physical relationship, um, their cognitive relationship is assisted by vicarious acts. You know, um, we have pregnancy testing kits. Uh, we have the development of ultrasonography. So, so men can see um the the fetus they may feel fetal movements externally 
But for men, the, the baby may not become real for them until after birth. And um, and, th- and that's expected. Um, uh, John Condon and, and, and Draper have looked at this issue and um, fathers really don't um, complete their attachment and transition until the, well into the postnatal period. And um, there have been studies that have looked at um, delaying delays in such attachment and transition, even in, in cases of exclusive breastfeeding. So in the pregnancy after loss, um, there have been many studies looking at um, anxiety, fear, um, depression, stress. And um, these are all a component of pregnancy after loss, I would argue. There's an expected anxiety. There's this fear of another loss. There's increased anxiety around appointments. There's hypervigilance or over, overprotection. Stress and worry are common. There, there's also a conflict of emotions in terms of fear, uh, guilt, um, grief, hope, joy. And oftentimes these couples feel very isolated and detached from the, um, the experience of, of pregnancy and the anticipation of birth as, at an individual level, but also they, fe- they feel isolated and detached from um, society because they're not like any other um, expectant couple. They have had experiences that have, have told them that actually a positive outcome isn't guaranteed. So my own study was, I suppose, based upon my own clinical experience and uh, wondering what it would be like for couples who are pregnant again and having to return to maternity services and, and, and meet the healthcare staff maybe that looked after them. And what would that be like? Would that be a positive thing or would it be a challenging thing? And also from a midwifery perspective, um, I was very much aware that the majority of research to date had been conducted looking at the negative um, psychological impl- influences um, of pregnancy after loss. And I wondered, were there any um, salutogenic or were there any positive um, experiences with regards to hope or optimism um, in a pregnancy after loss? Because I actually believe that couples who um, couples who engage in pregnancy after loss are in effect um, engaging in a hopeful act. If they didn't have hope of a positive outcome of a live birth, then they may not wish to even um, begin a pregnancy after loss. So that's where I came from coming to look at my study. And obviously, um, this was a very ethically challenging study and um, because I was interviewing couples who were pregnant again. Um, but um, I, I, I got approval from the local hospital ethics committee and had many, many support structures in place for um, re- the research participants should, um, should um, they, they required it. And um, over a six month period of data collection, eight heterosexual couples agreed to participate. Um, Now, I wasn't specifically looking for heterosexual couples, but um, these were the only the only couples who agreed to to um, who were interested and who agreed to participate. Um, So that's not to say that they weren't um, same sex couples um, within that data collection period, it's just that they did not um, um, come forward to, to meet with me. Um, so therefore, when I talk about the findings and the results, um, they are, it's with the caveat that they are, when I'm talking about the non-pregnant partner, I'm specifically in this instance talking about men. Um, and again, it was a, a long data collection period, uh, thankfully, because the, the numbers of pregnancy loss within our services were small, but also because um, I, I was, um, as part of the ethical approval, um, I did not have any direct contact with the study, potential study participants. So I don't know how many couples were approached and who maybe refused to take part. And thirdly, the issue was, I was very much interested in the couple relationship and the couple dynamic um, because that hadn't been looked at before. And so therefore I was looking to interview 
um, both the woman and the man together. And there may have been instances where um, couples may not have been happy to be interviewed together and uh, they may not have presented. And likewise, um, previous research has, has said that uh, women can often act as gatekeepers for their partners, um, maybe refusing um, participation in studies on the um, on the basis that that oh the, my, that my 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 partner wouldn't be interested in taking part. So again, those are challenges and limitations to the study. But I was very thankful that I had that I had eight couples who agreed to speak with me, and I I met them and did joint face-to-face -face interviews and they lasted anywhere from 70 to 120 minutes at a time and place of their choosing. And because I was really interested in the experience of these couples, it was a, a qualitative design that I used using interpretive phenomenological analysis. And that is, is quite a, um, a, a formatted and strict um, I, um, I, um, phenomenological study and the generation of themes that I'm going to talk about came directly from the participant data using the, the um, steps outlined by um, Smith et al in, in the development of IPA. So um, every, every single person uh, began their story and they talked about their pregnancy loss journey they began with the baby they knew best, and that was the baby who died. So when I asked couples, can you tell me what this pregnancy has been like for you? Every single person began with their story of the baby who died, and they began with, let me tell you what happened. And so in the telling of their story, um, they began their journey of pregnancy after loss. In terms of, uh, one thing that came out was in terms of knowing the baby who died. And again, there were very evident gender differences within this team. Um, the men felt that they did not know their deceased baby as well as their partners. And that had implications for them when it came to um, considering a subsequent pregnancy, because they felt they wanted to, um, to have protected time with that baby who died without um, muddying the waters with a subsequent pregnancy so that they could get it straight in their heads this is this baby before moving on to the next baby the women didn't, didn't have such issues they were very very adamant that the baby who died was an individual in their own right and this subsequent baby was a different baby so the women did not have any um concerns about um mixture of of personhood they were very definite that they were two individual babies and likewise they were very definite and very adamant that the subsequent baby was not a replacement for the baby who died this was an individual in their own right and um the baby that they had lost was was two and they could not be replacement for one another all couples felt and spoke about the care that they received at the time of their of their index loss and how they were cared for greatly affected their experiences and in some cases helped or hindered with their uh, pregnancy after last journey so they spoke in great um, with great eloquence about the care the empathic um, bereavement care they received at the time of loss and uh, likewise they spoke about having how having that um, care helped them in their grief, um, helped them honour the baby who had died, and helped them move forward in planning a subsequent pregnancy. In terms of their um, experiences of grief, again, they were very much um, um, divided along gendered, gendered lines. Women found it was more ex socially acceptable to display grief and likewise they also found solace in in peer support so speaking with other women who had experienced pregnancy loss getting together sharing stories the men in in my study did not want to talk about their their experiences of grief so therefore they struggled with conventional supports the idea of peer support groups uh, they went to support their partners, but they didn't actually get anything out of out of that. Um, 
they they felt that um, talking about it wasn't going to make any difference. Their child was still dead, and talking about it wasn't going to bring bring them back. There was also the the idea of the parent as a protector, and um, in cases of women, they immediately went to themselves. They immediately. Um, engaged in self-blame was it something I did was it something I ate was it something I didn't do and they blamed their failed bodies um, for um, for the death of their babies why couldn't I keep my baby alive women across the world in in, in very adverse um, adversarial conditions can do this and here was something I couldn't do and and this was this came from themselves. Uh, they were very well supported by their partners. Their partners actually explicitly said, "I did not blame you." This was coming from women themselves. Um, for men, the idea of parent as protector came from the idea of lack of awareness. How did I not know this could happen? She went off in to have her ultrasound scan, and she was told that the baby had a a lethal fetal anomaly or she had told she, she had decreased fetal movement she was in she went told the baby had died how did I not know this could happen I wasn't keeping an eye on things and so therefore it was men men in, too engaged in hyper vigilance in terms of pregnancy after loss they were very much talking about the care the care that their wives and their partners were going to receive and how they were going to uh, keep a strict eye on everything to make sure that this wasn't going to happen again when it came to when it came to deciding to try again again the um there were there were gender differences apparent in that for women um there was almost a, um, a visceral um urgent need to get to get pregnant again and as i said it, it wasn't to replace the baby who had died one woman was spoke about this quite elo eloquently she said it's not it's not that I want this baby to replace my daughter who died. I want the two of them. I want her and I want this baby as well. But women talked about um, almost a primal um, mothering instinct that they had all of this love and this nurturing available. And because they didn't have a baby, a live baby to, to um, care for, that they needed an outlet, they needed to put this love somewhere, and they they had all this love, and they wanted to give it uh, to to um, another baby. So, um, and it was also looking at the concept of repaired uh, maternal identity. It was as if they wanted to um, repair this failed body or this body that had failed them to protect their baby. Whereas I said previously, men needed time to get to know the baby who died before contemplating another another pregnancy because they felt that this was their only time to parent that child and they wanted to um, get that straight in their heads before they moved on to um, before they moved on to another pregnancy so in terms of of what came out of, of the study and I've only presented um, some of the findings here um, Clinical care at the time of loss, again, was, was reiterated as being something that was very important. Likewise, continuity of carer throughout. Good communication skills, shared decision making. And for midwives to be aware that many couples are pregnant again within a very, very short time frame and that they all these couples will need additional care and support it's not a question of whether or which they will need it and likewise a, a live birth of a subsequent baby will not end a parent's relationship with their deceased baby that will continue because parents will continue to parent their deceased baby for the remainder of their lives and their experiences of loss will influence their experiences of pregnancy and indeed parenthood forever just to say um, a, a, a few words of thanks. Obviously, there I have immense gratitude to the couples who shared their experiences and their family narratives with me. Um, I felt very honoured to bear witness to their stories.
And likewise, as a part of my research to, to my supervisors who were, who were very um, important in terms of data analysis. And likewise, thank you all for your time today and your interest um, in this topic. Um, we have a lot done, but there's a lot more to do. And uh, my, my email is there if anyone would like to contact me. Um, I'd be happy to, um, to take any uh, questions. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Margaret. Um, I was wary about um, warning you about time because this is such an important topic. Uh, maybe we could pursue this another time, but we do have a few minutes for questions. You could okay. uh, scroll back up the chat box and see if there's something that you want to make comment about yourself. Okay. Or people can actually ask questions just now. So somebody mentioned Celine uh, from Canada talked about the idea of, of uh, continued support. And um, and um, absolutely, within maternity services in high income countries, certainly, um, traditionally there's been an, there has almost uh, been this concept of of um, pregnancy after loss as healing. So oh thank goodness a woman's pre gotten pregnant again, and um, uh, you know that uh, that having a, a subsequent live baby almost and again maybe it's to do with the over reliance on the biophysical model this this idea that that function you know things are functioning the body is functioning the body is working again it can produce a live baby what what what, what is in fact the case and the work of of um joanne o'leary in us and jane warland in australia has been um over you know parents will continue um this journey throughout their lifetime it affects their their pregnancy after loss, but it also affects their parenting of the baby born after loss, and it affects their parenting of their other um, living children. And so therefore, experiences of grief and loss have, have long-term implications. And, and likewise, the, um, the pregnancy that follows a live birth, so if, if, so if, a, couple, if a woman experiences a stillbirth and she has a subsequent live birth, and she has a subsequent pregnancy. The experiences are often the same again. So just because she has given birth to a live baby in the interim period doesn't mean that, that, that women and men won't have the same worries or anxieties in pregnancy after loss. Again, it will never, it, they're, they're, the couples talk about a, um, um, a lack of innocence. So their innocence and their faith in the, um, Positive outcomes when it comes to pregnancy and birth have actually been have actually been um, destroyed forever. Um, yes, and these are a lot, a lot of sorry, a lot of grief theories are looking at the idea of post traumatic um, growth. Um, and again, that is a that is a that is a work in in progress. You know, um, that's a lifetime's worth of worth of um, worth of work, um, because again, there is a there. There is no one size fits all. I think when it comes to when it comes to loss and grief, um, so therefore, in in the way uh, in in the way in which we say, um, we looked at the work of say Elizabeth Kubler Ross back in the nineteen seventies, and she talked about the five stages of grief. So therefore, the assumption that if you didn't cut, if you didn't get to acceptance, there was something wrong with you. Um, I mean, that is still perpetuated within, certainly within the US healthcare system, that look that talks about um, complicated grief. You know, um, six weeks after after stillbirth, there is an awful lot of misunderstanding about grief and loss, and there's an awful lot of work that needs to be done to um to bring that into the mainstream obviously it's a it's 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 um those that are re that research the area um psychologists those that that um that care for people such as um, grief counselors are very well aware of this but the majority of us are not aware of the impact the lifelong impact on grief sorry linda thank you <laughs> that's okay I, I was trying so hard to allow you to um 
uh, finish off. It is such an important topic, oh, and it seems so. such a shame. So thank you very, very much, Margaret. That was a, a very mind-provoking um, conversation, and I wish we could continue, but I'm afraid we can't.